me. I know what you're waiting for is 18 days from now when Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan are going to change America for the better. I watched it at home. I stayed on my couch. And, and, and you know, I made my son Patrick, who's 12 years old, bring me a big bottle of water. Because whenever I hear that much BS, I start to get lightheaded. And I had to remain hydrated. Make sure that I stayed conscious. Because I wanted to hear every word that they were saying at this convention down the road a bit in Charlotte. And let me tell you what one of the most amazing things I heard them say was. President of the United States Party, at his convention, said... The following words, now I want you to listen carefully. Government is the only thing we all belong to. <laughs> now, I know I, that was a little bit of a moment, but I want you to listen harder to that. Listen one more time. Government is the only thing we all belong to. <laughs> belong to I, I, you know, now listen, I'm from New Jersey. And there's 700,000 more Democrats than Republicans, and it's a blue state, and it's a tough spot to be a conservative Republican. But even in New Jersey, we were taught growing up that we don't belong to government. The government belongs to us. <laughs> See, and that's his president's philosophy, the philosophy the president's that our earnings belong to the government that our families belong to the government, that we are pawns for him and the millions of additional bureaucrats he's hired in little cubicles all over Washington, D.C. to plot and plan all of our futures. That's what this president believes. That statement can't mean anything else other than that, that we belong to the government. I mean, government's the only thing we all belong to. I mean, I don't understand what else that could mean. I mean, this is him looking at us as if we're possessions of his grand plan. See, that's never been the country that I thought we were. See, I've read the Constitution. I think all of you have read it, too. It doesn't start off, we the government. It starts off, we the people. It's we the people. We the people who give. It's we the people. We the people who give limited power, limited power and authority to the government to help run a civilized society. We did not hand over our lives to the federal government. We did not hand over every bit of our treasure to the, to the federal government. We did not hand over our children's future to the federal government. Those things belong to us, not the other way around. But if we reelect Barack Obama, if we reelect Barack Obama, we are going to be looking once again at a country that he thinks should be owned by the government, that the government should pick the winners and losers, that the government should decide whether a company like this is successful or not. See, I think that America should continue to pick winners and losers the way it always has, based upon three very important things. One, integrity. The integrity of each individual. <laughs> Two, ingenuity. Who's got the best ideas, the smartest ideas, the newest ideas? Those are the ones that should be rewarded. And three, and most importantly, work ethic. Because Americans always prove we'll work harder than anybody to get the job self anymore. It's a nice little club we all belong to, the government. Well, I've got to tell you something. That's not a club I want to belong to. It's not a club I want to belong to. And especially when it's not run by club master Barack Obama. Now, that community organizer may have worked in Chicago, but it ain't going to work as president. <laughs> Second thing the president said recently was he said, you can't change Washington, D.C. from the inside. <laughs> now, I, I was listening to that one. And you know what? I, I started to feel bad for the president. And I know we've got some media folks out there, and, and you know, you may not know this, but the president loves me. He really does. He loves watching me on TV. He loves the stuff I say. He loves me. And so, since he loves me, I want to help the president. And so here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you, Mr. President. I want to let you know, you've been living inside 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue 
for the last four years. If you don't think you could change Washington from inside the White House, then let's give you a closer. I mean, that's a scary thing for the President of the United States to say, isn't it? You can't change Washington from the inside. Really? You can't change Washington from the inside. It shows his arrogance. See, because if he really believes that, if he believes that, then what the hell is he doing asking for another? And the worst part of that is, when he says that, it shows even more about his arrogance. See, because what he's saying is, it's not my fault. See, it's not my responsibility. It's not my fault. It's George W. Bush's fault, right? It's Dick Cheney's fault. It's Big Oil's fault. It's the coal company's fault. It's the gas company's fault. It's the fault of the Republicans in Congress. It's John Boehner's fault. It's Eric Cantor's fault. It's Kevin McCarthy's fault. It's Mitch McConnell's fault. For God's sake, it's anybody's fault but mine. That's what he's saying to us. And no, he says, please, just give me another four years. I'll figure it out. Well, you know what, Mr. President? I'm tired of waiting for you to figure it out. See, I feel bad for the president. I really do. I do. See, he doesn't know anything about leading. He's never led anything in his life. Until we made him president of the United States, he never led anything in his life. Now, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to any legislators who might be out here, but, you know, being in the legislature doesn't make you a leader. You don't have to make all those decisions. You vote on something in the subcommittee or the committee, and then he became a United States senator, and he barely showed up in Washington, D.C. to take the oath of office and started running for president of the United States. And he spent the next two years running for president of the United States. And he'd been a law professor, a community organizer, and a state legislator. He'd never run anything in his life. And so the president doesn't know how to lead. I mean, watch what he's been like for the past four years. He's like a man wandering around a dark room, hand up against the wall, clutching for the light switch of leadership. And he just can't find it. Looking for a clue. And you know, the unfortunate thing for the president is this, is that there are clues everywhere. If he would just open his eyes and learn how to lead, there are clues everywhere. The American people want to be led. 23 million Americans who are out of work want a leader in the White House that will get the government out of the way and let businesses like ball office products and the millions of others like them grow and prosper and start putting people back to work. Care of. America's always been a compassionate country. We take care of our neighbors, whether the government asks us to or not. And we know the government needs to be there for those who have fallen on difficult times. Mitt Romney believes that, too. And he knows that we need to have a government that is efficient enough in other areas, that eliminates other spending, so that we can make sure we do the core things the government needs to do, defend the safety and security of our nation, and make sure that our least fortunate are given a hand up to get themselves back on their feet so they can start working for themselves and their families again. Yeah. Mr. President, what we reject, and what we will reject on November 6th, is an agenda that says government is the solution to every one of our problems. I heard the President the other night in the debate say, Governor Romney says that I want a bigger government, and that's just not true. Well, Governor Romney's not the guy who's run up $6 trillion in new debt in four years as president. Governor Romney's not the one that's created new boards, commissions, czars all over government that he's paying millions and millions and millions of dollars to of our money to try to manipulate more and more things in the private economy to try to get his desired result. And let me tell you, Mitt Romney's not the guy who's looking to take money away from hardworking Americans and redistribute it across the country based on the government's plan. He thinks the American people should be able to decide how to spend their own money, not the government. <laughs> Thursday morning, they're all calling my office in Trenton saying, how did you know? <laughs> what did you know? When did you know it? How didn't we know? And I just looked at him and said, here's why I said what I said. It's two very simple reasons. First, I know Mitt Romney. I know Mitt Romney. I've been supporting him and campaigning for him for over a year. And I've been friends with him for four. And I know that every time in this campaign, when Mitt Romney was up against the wall, 
People were predicting that he was going to finish his campaign, lose, be ended by other people. The competitive fire inside Mitt Romney said no. Ask Newt Gingrich. <laughs> Ask Newt Gingrich after he beat Governor Romney in South Carolina and sat on TV and said, I think it's pretty clear that I'm going to be the Republican nominee for president. <laughs> and then he went down to Florida and Mitt Romney wiped the floor with him and ended his campaign. <laughs> and then Rick Perry, old Rick Perry came sashaying up from Texas saying he was the front runner in New Hampshire. And Governor Romney stood on the stage with him in New Hampshire and gave him such a whooping. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor's right, there's 18 days to go. And let me tell you this, it encourages me so much to see all of you out here today because Virginia is a state of consequence. See, I come from New Jersey. We are not. <laughs> I hate to tell you that I'm fairly confident Barack Obama will be winning New Jersey. In fact, we had a fundraiser up in New Jersey a number of months ago for Governor Romney. Governor Romney's there with a small group of people in a hotel, a ballroom, around a table, maybe about 20 folks. And this one guy from New Jersey, he was impassioned. He's like banging on the table. Governor Romney, you must campaign in New Jersey. You must spend money in New Jersey. You can win New Jersey. Governor Christie won New Jersey. You can win New Jersey. You must do it. Mitt took a sip of his water, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, Chris, is there any way I'm going to win New Jersey? And I said, no, there's not. And he goes... <laughs> And he said, next question. <laughs> you see, you, this I'm entire not... election could come down to what you do in Virginia. In fact, it's likely to come down to what you do in Virginia. And so when Mitt Romney asked me to come down here to Virginia today, I said yes, because you're a state of consequence because you're a place that's going to make a difference in our country's future. I see these young guys from St. Benedict's Catholic School standing up here in front of me. Yes. Yes, I do. I see these young guys right here. And what you do, what you do in the next 18 days isn't for me. And it isn't for Mitt Romney. And it's not for Paul Ryan. It's not for George Allen. What you're doing in the next 18 days are for these guys. You see, because no matter what happens in the next 18 days, when I look at most of the faces out here in this crowd, we've already had a great American life. We've already had a life that has been blessed already because we've been Americans in a country that's the most prosperous and the freest that the world's ever known. But what about them? Yep. See, every generation before ours has met the test, which is to leave this country better for the next generation that was left for us. No matter what the challenge, no matter what the threat, no matter what the cause, the American people always rose to those challenges, not for themselves, but for them. And so now, with 18 days left, my question to you in Virginia is, how hard are you willing to work to meet that challenge for them? We can do it. For them. Yeah. See, because I know we agree on this. I know we agree on this that we don't want to be the first generation that decides that we're going to assuage ourselves with our creature comforts, that we're going to bury our heads in the sand, that we're going to say these problems are too big and too hard, that everything is too difficult and that we're not strong enough to fight back. We don't want to be the first set of Americans who does that. And think about this. You know, you had a lot of people who helped to start this great nation in this commonwealth. America wouldn't be America without Thomas Jefferson, without James Madison, all from the commonwealth of Virginia and, of course, without George Washington. But we also had a great patriot up north, too. Few. <laughs> John Adams. John Adams, who understood and articulated almost as well as Jefferson what it meant to be an American. And after 50 years of America, the America he had fought for and put his life on the line for, Adams was near death. And this is what he wrote in his diary. And he wrote it for us. He wrote it for us. And this is what he said. He said, you shall never know the sacrifices that we have made to secure for you your liberty. Make a good use of it. For if you do not, 
I shall repent in heaven for ever having made the sacrifice at all. John Adams understood that it was not only enough to serve his country, but he needed to challenge the next generation to serve as well. And on his dying day, he wrote that in his diary. Not for himself, but for us. So that when this challenge came, a challenge he could have never foreseen, in an America who is only part of his most distant dream, a continental country, the most powerful and successful the world has ever seen, with $16 trillion in debt, and a, and a country full of citizens who are hopeful but dispirited. He never saw this challenge, but he knew a challenge would come. And he does not deserve to repent in heaven for the sacrifices he made because we are unwilling to meet that challenge for the next generation. The difference in this election is that Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan understand the gravity of the challenge, they understand it's going to hurt to fix it, but what they believe in more than the President of the United States does is the strength and the resilience of the American people to hear the truth, to step up to the plate to make the sacrifices, and to restore our country back to a greatness that we have often had and always deserve. And so now I want all of you in the next 18 days to decide how much of your time are you willing to sacrifice? How much of your time are you willing to put forward to make sure that America picks the right course this time? I will tell you I am going to be all over the country for the next 18 days because I have four children between 9 and 19, and I do not want nor will I willingly permit them to only know about an American century by reading about it in textbooks. I want them to live in the second American century, and we have to make it happen you for them. Understand. Your state of consequence. You can make a difference in America's future. You can't give in. Get home. Open that phone book of yours. Get on the phone with every friend and neighbor and relative and business associate and client and customer that you have and tell them all that now's not the time to sit on the sidelines, that with 18 days to go, they need to give you their solemn oath that they're going to vote in this election and they're going to vote for Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan because you know that that's the way to fix this broken country. And so get on the phone. Go door to door. Go to call centers. Do anything you can over the next 18 days. Go home and look at it. You can give an hour a day for the next 18 days. An hour a day. Just one hour a day for the next 18 days. If you do that, I'm willing to guarantee you something. Virginia is going to turn the beautiful red of this woman's vest right here in the front. And I'm going to be, and I'm going to be sitting up in New Jersey watching my TV. And when they put that big old map on the television set and Virginia starts flashing and it flashes and comes up red, that is going to be the red carpet that leads Mitt Romney to the White House. If you're, if you're willing to do that in the next 18 days, I'm going to give it everything I got. If you're willing to fight with me, I'm willing to fight with you. If you're willing to say we are going to once again restore America to greatness by electing leaders leaders who know how to lead, who are not afraid to lead, who are not afraid to tell us the truth, and who care more about getting reelected. We got to get rid of those. And we got to worry about putting somebody in the White House who wants to fix these problems and doesn't care whether they're reelected or not. I can tell you, I've, I know Mitt Romney. I've looked him in the eye. I've asked him this question. Will you do whatever you need to do to fix our country, regardless of the politics? And he looked back at me and said, that's why I'm running. That's why he's family. running for President of the United States. For what they do every day to help to make Virginia a better place, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be out here today and say hello to me and make a, make a guy from New Jersey. <laughs> Farewell, feel welcome down here in Virginia. You do. And I want you, I want you to know that with every breath I've got, I am going to be talking for the next 18 days to make sure the American people understand what the stakes are in this election and what we need to do to make sure that these kids 
have the same kind of future that we've been fortunate enough and blessed enough to have in America. If you are willing to fight for those things, so am I. Let's go fight the next TT days and let's win. Thank you all very much.